Coming up on Focus Black Oklahoma, the alarming death rate black women experience during childbirth. A rural teacher speaks out about potentially dangerous protocols in a northeastern school district and why it's unsafe. How black nurses are going above and beyond to support their patients in their community during the COVID-19 pandemic. The unexpected lesson COVID-19 revealed at Muskogee's Cherokee Elementary School, the Biden administration's promises to the black community, and we speak with Marilyn Van, the president of the Freedmen of the Five Tribes Association, who is running for a seat on the Cherokee Tribal Council. All this and more on Focus Black Oklahoma. KOSU is made possible by the generous support of members who are listeners just like you. Become a sustaining member and make your gift go even further. Click donate at kosu.org to start your membership today. Focus Black Oklahoma. I'm Ariel Davis. And I'm Colby Webster. Black women in Oklahoma face disproportionate challenges when it comes to surviving childbirth. Autumn Brown explores the historic precedents that perpetuate this deadly trend and its pervasiveness through the country's healthcare industry. The news of pregnancy for some is a momentous occasion filled with celebration and excitement. But for Black women in Oklahoma, pregnancy is sometimes a matter of life and death. Black women die at nearly three times the rate of white women during or shortly after pregnancy. In addition to that, for every one woman who dies, there are about 70 who have life-threatening complications related to birth or pregnancy. During pregnancy, I think there were probably signs there. I was under the care of a OBGYN and a high-risk OBGYN. So I felt like my doctors were super amazing. Me being in the professional world and me being an educator to women about the importance of taking care of themselves during pregnancy and stuff, I didn't even really realize the things I needed to be watching for myself. Marnie Jackson gave birth to a healthy baby girl, and it almost cost her her life. When I got to the doctor's office, I felt so bad that I was praying that they would just admit me because I, at this point I couldn't breathe. Well, I continued to get worse, and I went in for the, like, the next couple of weeks, um, once a week for checkups, and um, she told me that it would just take time for me to get better because I had double pneumonia. So going into my fourth week, my oldest daughter came home from college, and at this point, I couldn't even probably walk five steps and felt like I was about to black out. So I drove to the hospital and I wrote down all the things I was experiencing, which was back spasms, chest pains, double pneumonia, and shortness of breath. And so I went to sit down in the lobby and they ran all the initial tests. And so um, they hooked up the EKG machine. They started um, doing an ultrasound on my heart. And um, at this point, they're putting me in the back room and telling me that I'm possibly um, in heart failure and was on the verge of a heart attack. So after they got all their tests ran and everything, at this point, I just, I was so numb to the situation because I felt like I'm in a safe place now that if anything happens that I'm, I'm here. They finally have me in a room. They're not going to turn me away now. So I am in a safe place. So if I stop breathing right now, they're here. And so finally, once they did get my, all the test results back, they came in and they told me my heart function was at 15% and that one more day I would have had a heart attack. Maternal mortality among Black women is a systemic issue with a myriad of factors, including barriers to quality health care, 
racism, and unconscious bias. Labrisa Williams, who is executive director of the Tulsa Birth Equity Initiative, speaks to why such a gross disparity exists. Yeah, so the disparity that Black women and Black mothers are experiencing is a clear sign that structural racism exists. And race is one of the most reliable predictors of life outcomes across several areas, as well as maternal mortality. So there's no educating ourselves out of this issue or making more money to really escape the inequities that Black women and Black mothers experience. Um, some of the things that I've learned through, you know, research and learning more about Black maternal health is the lack of communication and teamwork is a root cause. Um, and when Black women express concerns about how they're feeling, particularly around pain, the health system is slower to respond. A lack of communication and teamwork were both factors in Marnie Jackson's near mortality after the birth of her fourth child. It made me realize that I wish the OB and the primary care doctors communicated because I felt like I was the go-between between, between, you know, if it was something going on with me and I didn't feel well, I would call my primary care. My primary care didn't feel comfortable prescribing or doing anything without approval from my OB, but it was almost like they never took the time to just pick up the phone and call each other. What makes the statistics surrounding maternal mortality for Black women more shocking is the fact that maternal deaths disproportionately affect Black women regardless of socioeconomic status or education. This issue isn't exclusive to only poor Black women. Beyonce suffered life-threatening complications with the birth of her twins, and Serena Williams almost died after an emergency C-section delivering her daughter. Hence, we cannot educate ourselves out of this problem. And so regardless of income, regardless of education, and there are many data points that also talk about how um, Black mothers with college degrees have higher rates of harm than women of all races without high school diplomas. And so it goes to show that regardless of education level, regardless of income, the risk factor is that I am a Black woman. Unfortunately, the problem with maternal mortality rates among Black women is not unique to just Oklahoma. Across the country, Black mothers die at a rate 3.3 times higher than white women. The Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System is an ongoing population-based study designed to collect information about maternal behaviors and experiences before, during, and after pregnancy. This study found that pregnant Black women, on average, receive differing medical information from their doctors than white women. While white women are informed about proper nutrition and appropriate weight gain, Black women are counseled on illicit drug use and physical abuse. The problem exists to systematic racism, including at the hospital level, and then implicit bias on the part of people working within the healthcare spaces. And so hospital programming is designed to make the hospital system and the burden process more trustworthy and accountable and not asking community to just trust. And so systematic racism exists as it is systemic, and it is deeply ingrained in all sectors, including healthcare settings. Some researchers also point to racial weathering as a factor to consider. Racial weathering is the result of chronic stress in Black women that can lead to other health problems. Though implicit bias and racism are taking a deadly toll on Black mothers, there are ways we can save ourselves. Yeah, I would encourage Black birthing people to get support from birth workers, doulas, midwives, birth workers of color that have some shared lived experience as them, and find people that can advocate for them on their behalf during and after childbirth. It is an everyday fight for Black women mitigating the hospital industrial complex. And as they struggle to be heard, fiercely using our voice to shed light on this epidemic remains imperative. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Autumn Brown in Oklahoma City. View. Healthcare workers are struggling as the country reckons with a new peak in cases of COVID-19. Contributor Nick Alexandrov interviews two nurses from the Eastern Oklahoma Black Nurses Association to show us inside the massive influx of patients that are arriving at Tulsa hospitals with needs beyond standard medical attention. Everybody is being real creative to, to try to survive. That's a North Tulsa nurse. She's talking about the pandemic's impact on her community. 
everybody's hurting as far as if I can't work, then I can't, you know, take care of my family. Her name is Wendy Williams. I uh, moved to Tulsa in 1989. I've been a nurse since 1988. Um, Since living in Oklahoma, I've had various, various nursing positions from school nurse to nursing home, home health. Um, But my passion in most of my career has been um, in education. I own a um, healthcare training center. I spoke to Wendy via Zoom one snowy Sunday in December. Anita williams Morell, no relation to Wendy, joined us on the call. I've been in the field of nursing um, since 1990, gosh, 1995. And I've worked uh, a lot of different jobs, you know, from home health to clinic settings to hospital settings. And right now I'm currently a nurse practitioner and I'm the owner and um, nurse practitioner for A&M Healthcare Clinic. Um, our clinic opened in 2018. We try to keep our services as comprehensive and low cost as possible. And we are located in the North Tulsa area. Anita and Wendy are both members of the Eastern Oklahoma Black Nurses Association. The group is based in Tulsa and was founded in 2010. So with that organization, our uh, goal was to reach out and um, just be um, healthcare educators for the community. With their deep involvement in North Tulsa life, the nurses have seen up close the effects of the virus. Anita described its physical toll. The people that have the worst symptoms for my clinic, and I'll say it that way, um, they're usually between the ages of 45 and 65. I mean, I have one patient that was in ICU about two months ago, and we're Mm -hmm. still seeing the the pulmonary effects. You know, they're still having respiratory issues where before COVID, they didn't have any Mm -hmm. respiratory issues at all. She talked about mental health as well. Over the past year, she's seen a sharp rise in pandemic-related stress. Anxiety and, and depression has gone up 110% in my clinic. I've, I spend a lot of time just, um, you know, along with the teaching, just, you know, just offering therapeutic listening because, you know, when you have parents that are teaching their kids from home for the first time and with all of the challenges that technology brings, you know, people don't have anybody to vent to. They don't have anybody to, you know, get those emotions out that they're feeling. So, you know, a lot of times the first 10 or 15 minutes of our visit is just them just venting. I'm probably doing more mental health than medical. And the nurses provide their community with more than just medical care. Anita and I, we've been giving out food. You know, a lot of People may say, well, you're a clinic, you know, why does it matter? Well, it matters because if people are hungry, you know, the last thing they're going to want to do is, you know, come to a clinic and talk about their health care. Our talk of the pandemic's damage areas, the lungs, the mind, savings accounts, and family food supplies soon turn to the fact that this damage in Oklahoma is extensive. State officials do little to contain it. Crowds continue to gather, and the virus continues to surge. First we hear from Wendy, then Anita. It kind of makes me wonder when I see a lot of uh, congregating, because I feel like as an essential worker, I'm putting myself in positions to keep our essential workers working. It doesn't make me necessarily angry, but it just makes me wonder what they're thinking and You know, do they have they been impacted personally? Because I guarantee you, if someone is personally impacted by this virus, they would change their behavior. They would change it. For me, it is a little frustrating because when I go to places like Quick Trip that have on the door before you enter, mask is required. But when you go inside, you see about 50 percent of the people not wearing masks. So I'm wondering what are the people thinking. And then I'm wondering, what are the business owners thinking? I just think if we could get just a clear, concise message, wear your mask, I think things would be a lot better. The nurses looking back on 2020 surveyed a bleak scene, one that seems hopeless. 
So I asked what sustains them. You know, we put ourselves at risk, but um, we that's what we we trained to do. We we took the, the Hippocratic oath, you know, to do no harm, to do, you know, so we, I, I just don't know who else is going to do it. And, and, and I just bless the healthcare workers. They just, yeah. we have to do it. We have to do it. Absolutely. And what gets me out of bed is asking the question, what would Jesus do? Jesus will continue to heal his healing ministry. So we are the extension of that to go and serve our community and serve well. Ensuring community needs are met, ensuring our community members survive, it's hard to think of more pressing priorities. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Nick Alexandrov in Tulsa. Now, these headlines from across the state. Calls for Oklahoma Senator James Lankford to step down from the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission are multiplying across the state. Lankford was the last senator who spoke as part of a 15-member electoral commission established to investigate fraud in the November 2020 election. He was at the podium when insurrectionists made their way into the Capitol. Oklahoma State Representative Monroe Nichols, who also sits on the commission, stated to the Black Wall Street Times that, quote, Senator Lankford peddled a set of dangerous lies with regard to the 2020 elections and, in doing so, played a central role in the riot, unquote. Former Oklahoma State Senator Judy Eason McIntyre said, quote, every day since the assault on the United States Capitol, Senator Lankford has decided to repeatedly abdicate his duty to the people of Oklahoma by hiding his tepid repudiation of domestic terrorism, unquote. Oklahoma Democratic Party Chairwoman Alicia Andrews has also called for Lankford's removal from the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. Lankford told the Tulsa World on January 13th, quote, I was shocked when black friends said to me, This was about keeping African-Americans from voting. My comment to them was, that never crossed my mind. Why would I do that? Why would I think that? Unquote. Governor Kevin Stitt has announced a new COVID-19 policy for children in Oklahoma's public schools. Students and teachers exposed in a classroom setting are no longer required to quarantine as long as masks and other protocols were taken into precaution in the classroom. Stitt cited a North Carolina study which showed in-school transmission was rare. However, this was a false equivalency as the North Carolina schools only required in-person attendance twice a week with buildings at partial capacity, masks and distancing required, and daily health screenings. Quote, While this option underscores the need for mask requirements in school, I cannot in good conscience support ignoring quarantine guidelines from the CDC and other infectious disease experts, unquote, said State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister, who was not invited to Tuesday's announcement. The Oklahoma State Department of Education was not consulted about the policy change. Educators surveyed by the Oklahoma Education Association revealed staggering numbers which indicated that classroom infection rates are trending at similar rates as healthcare workers. The OEA also reported that 67% of its members do not believe that schools are currently safe for in-person instruction. Due to increased online enrollment during the pandemic, the state has funded Epic Charter Schools an additional $156 million. In comparison, nearly 500 out of 509 school districts and 31 traditional charter schools saw reductions in funding of 10% or more. These mid-year adjustments coming just a few months after the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation revealed that co-founders of Epic Charter Schools, David Cheney and Ben Harris, split $10 million in profits from years 2013 to 2018, gained from recruiting students to fill virtual seats, 
but with minimal instruction or academic accountability. You're listening to Focus Black Oklahoma. KOSU has a podcast to bring you news on what's happening in the state of Oklahoma. The KOSU Daily includes local headlines. State Impact reporters will bring us the latest on education, health care, and criminal justice. And we have news focusing on agriculture and rural issues, as well as indigenous affairs. You can subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. The KOSU Daily, Oklahoma News, every weekday. We hear from one Oklahoma teacher who expresses deep concern for the way education leaders and administrators are handling COVID-19 protocols in northeastern Oklahoma's rural counties while cases continue to rise across the state. Devin Williams has the story. The stress that COVID-19 has placed on Oklahoma schools has led to the development of a protocol system. The Oklahoma State School Board Association, or OSSBA, in conjunction with the state health department, develop these protocols to ensure the safety of schools, students, faculty, families, and communities, and hopefully slow the spread of the coronavirus. The OSSBA issued COVID-19 protocols that have been adopted by many populous Oklahoma counties. In an abridged explanation, it is a color-coded system which guides public schools on how much in-person education should take place per 100,000 positive tests in a specific county. The colors are represented as green, yellow, orange one, orange two, and red. Green being least severe, 1.43 positive tests per 100,000, to red, 50 plus positive tests per 100,000, being the most severe. You can easily view your county's level on the OSSBA's COVID-19 map, which is located on their website at OSSBA.org. In some northeastern rural counties, like the school we will be examining in this story, even the simplest mandated protocols like masks, at their very best, are optional guidelines. So every kid, as they come into school, they're asked, hey, do you have your water bottle? Do you have your mask? And then... (laughs) The person asking that half of the time doesn't have their own. So that level of not modeling what you're telling the kids to do is what we're fighting. The back to school meeting at the beginning of the year, I was the only teacher present wearing a mask. Now that was only for half the school, so it wasn't the entire staff there. It was a handful of teachers, but I was the only staff member in attendance wearing a mask. We will be hearing the candid perspective of a teacher in rural Oklahoma, who we will call Jamie. Like we're dealing with the same thing with masks. The last board meeting, we had a teacher say that her seventh grader is really, he really, really has a hard time wearing a mask. I was like, that really stinks. But you know what would be worse? Killing your grandparent. Because realistically, that's another option. And I get that it's hard for a seventh grader, but if the kindergartners can wear their masks, I don't see why a seventh grader couldn't. Jamie is a middle school teacher. Jamie wishes to remain anonymous from fear of retaliation or harassment from the school administration or other teachers. Definitely. Like, there's some people that will walk by without their masks on and they'll, like, teachers, and they'll quickly, they see a couple of us in the hall, they'll put their arm over their mouth like that counts as a mask suddenly, which is humorous, but I've seen it multiple times. You would hope that teachers would have a better grasp of the amount of influence that our actions have over the students, or that as staff members, the kids look at us and they say, hey, if she doesn't have to wear her mask, why do I have to wear mine? And we've got to model It's hard, it's gross, it's sweaty, it's annoying, but it beats being on a ventilator. As a precaution, we will not disclose the name of the school Jamie teaches at, and we have also altered Jamie's voice. If you are a resident of a larger city like Tulsa, OKC, or Enid, you no doubt have had to deal with in-person education being totally canceled or at least postponed due to an outbreak or as a safety precaution. We also did our best to make sure every kid had internet. And I know that 
kids move from house to house or they're living with grandma this week or custody issues. But we did our best to make sure that every kid had Wi-Fi. They all took a Chromebook home when we knew that they were going to Orange 2. Theoretically, in the middle school level, the only kids that should have been on campus were kids that were special ed or kids that did not have internet access. But we had taken care of all the internet access issues beforehand. So really, it should have just been a handful of students total. The school where Jamie teaches has chosen to redefine and disregard the recommended Orange 1 and 2 protocols. When I've brought that up, it's been addressed as, well, we're subtracting cases for people that are in prisons, and we're subtracting cases for nursing homes. So many cases are getting subtracted out that it's making the number so blurry. By the time it gets to us, we're not really sure how levels are being calculated or one week we're told to go with this map and the next week we're told we're following this one. So that part's gotten very convoluted. Consolidating these two protocols into one category allows the school to stay at 100% in-person education. They actually went so far as to say, like, you signed up for this year knowing that this job means you're putting the kids before your health and your family. According to the official OSSBA COVID-19 map, 85% of Oklahoma counties are irrefutably in the red category. The school board further manipulated the recommended red protocols to in-person instruction with 50% capacity of the school instead of the current OSSBA recommendation of 15% of enrolled students. Um, right now, the only threshold that we are not meeting is the ICU capacity because there's still enough ICU beds in the state that's keeping us from going to the next level. However, our next level is only going to be 50% of the students in attendance. It's no longer going to be no students in attendance, which was the original plan. Jamie expressed concerns with leadership. They were heard, but ultimately those concerns were dismissed. A couple of teachers attended a meeting and expressed our concerns and we felt like we were heard, maybe not by our administration, but we were heard by the board. And the following meeting, there were people there, teachers and other staff members that were not necessarily classroom teachers that were saying the kids really want to be back and we really want them back. I take full responsibility. It's not my fault that it came here. It's China's fault, was a response of President Donald J. Trump when asked if he would take ownership of his administration's handling of the pandemic. Even before then, the buck had been passed to governors and other elected officials and now schools, administrators, teachers, and children. Until that tremendous weight rests on the shoulders of those who are capable of delivering relief, the danger of this invisible marauder will continue to lurk in our places of worship, our stores, our restaurants, and yes, even our schools. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Devin Williams in Northeastern Oklahoma. Hear how Muskogee educators uncovered an unexpected benefit of COVID-19 that caused them to re-examine relationships with families, communities, and community partners. Bracken Clark has more. Among the small, medium, and unimaginable losses COVID is forcing on us, we have been given many reasons to pause, to step back and think about what we've been doing and what we are doing, to consider processes and ask, why have we been doing things this way? Is there a better way to do the things we've always done rather than doing them that way just because that's the way that they have always been done? Many are looking to carry forward what has been learned during this pandemic to help education on the other side of COVID. Communities should be held accountable for the people that live in them. We need to see more community activists. We need to see more organizations that are capable of meeting some of these needs, not just with the food. Everybody has six gallons of milk and no Wi-Fi. So I think that there are some deeper issues that as organizations, as community stakeholders, we really need to address. That's Melody Cranford, a second grade teacher at Cherokee Elementary in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Even before the pandemic, Cherokee had made many positive changes. 
it's hearted in a deep-seated, richly populated African-American community. It always has been. My school was written off. You know, it was the dumping ground, if you will. If you got put out of all of the other schools prior to me coming, you got sent to Cherokee. That's Dr. Reuben McIntosh, principal of Cherokee Elementary. Both McIntosh and Cranford spoke of the positive developments in student outcomes and the rich impact on student lives gained by the school's deep connections with community partners. It was phenomenal. The school has turned around and we are no longer on the failing list for the report cards for the school. It has had a history track for several years of being a very low performing school, but we've exited that list. And community impact and resources and pouring in, not only just philanthropic through monetary measures, but also through time and continued ongoing input. We always have a culmination assembly at the end of the month and bringing in community members and leaders. There were a couple of mentor groups in which older, whether they were retired educators or they were current community leaders would come into the school and to pour into those young people who may have limited, whether it's paternal leadership at home, to really provide for them some alternatives of those that are pouring and committed. Then COVID hit and schools were forced to go virtual. Refusing to let the impacts of COVID continue unopposed, Cherokee Elementary found new ways to connect with their families, community, and community partners. We went to the Arrowhead Mall about 15 years ago. It was the place to be. But nevertheless, we set up in the food court there. Families and students come out and receive supports as far as academics, whether it's technology with the Chromebooks and all of that stuff and hotspots and things of that nature. Not only that, but the social and emotional development. We have our Green Country Counseling Agencies as then as well as other community resources to really help provide and equalize any barriers that may present themselves. I think that's been the greatest thing that we've done to impact family members because parents didn't know, they're like, where is all this stuff? I see that my kid is missing assignments. Where can I find that? How do I assist them with this? Looking to find new ways to set up families for success in the distance learning model, Cranford founded Dot to Dot Educational Collaboration. It's an organization that I founded during this time to connect the gaps between family, schools, and community. I think that this organization, like I said, was just a lifeline for a lot of families because they wanted the assistance and didn't quite know how to ask for it. I went into homes and set up workspaces so that parents, they wanted the workspaces, didn't know exactly what they needed for their scholars to be successful, just to get that organization, the designated space so that the kid would know they are in school. And then, like I said, partnering with the NAACP, the mayor, and just getting out and being active and gaining that rapport with families so that they would know that they would be okay. And McIntosh started a YouTube channel to help students, teachers, and families. I have several videos, and whether they're instructional video support for teachers or whether they're, you know, encouragement for scholars or whether there is parental support on how to be successful in distance learning, all of those measures have been taken into account and have been actively promoted during this time. With the mounting persistence of such great losses and new promises of return to normalcy promised by vaccines, now is the time for us to take stock of what we've learned during the pandemic. Education does not happen only in school buildings, and classroom teachers are not the only people involved in educating children. And we really need to start where we are. We need to start locally. If communities change, then the world changes. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Bracken Clark reporting from Muskogee. Marilyn Van has always known her family origins as a Cherokee freedman. Van is the president of the Freedmen of the Five Tribes Association and was the lead plaintiff in the case to gain full recognition of citizenship by the Cherokee Nation. Van won that case in 2017. Now, she's running for a seat on the Cherokee Tribal Council and has been working with freedmen from other tribes to help them gain their citizenship. Allison Herrera spoke with Van. Marilyn Van, thanks so much for talking to me today. So you are the president of the Descendants of the Freedmen of the Five Tribes. So tell me a little bit about that organization and the work it's currently doing. Okay, uh, the Descendants of Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes Association. We're a nonprofit. We uh, started about 18 years ago for to fight for enforcement of the treaty rights of the freedmen. We are trying to raise awareness of the disenrollment of the freedmen in tribes such as the Creek Nation, 
the Choctaw Nation, the discrimination being faced by freedmen tribal members in the Seminole Nation, and also we're working to try to get Cherokee freedmen who are entitled to full rights in the tribe registered to vote and becoming aware of the different programs, cultural as well as financial, in the tribe. So those are the things that we're trying to do right now. Again, raise support for future litigation, do education, those kind of things. You were plaintiff in, in, in a case that won Cherokee freedmen, like yourself, the right to become citizens of the Cherokee Nation. That was in 2017. Tell us about that case. Actually, there were two cases that were started. One, the 2003, we had the, it was initially Van versus Norton. Myself and some litigants started that case. A large part of that was trying to block the U.S. government from approving a constitution where the federal government it would be more difficult for them to protect the freedmen. That went on for a while. Then in 2009, the tribe started their own case, Cherokee Nation versus Nash, where they sued some individual litigants. Eventually, the persons on the other lawsuit the original lawsuit were added to the case, including myself. So the tribe asked, said they wanted a judge to render an opinion on what the freedmen rights were. And the tribe's position was, well, we have the right to put the people out, but the federal government's already put them out again more than a hundred years ago. That was, a, that was kind of the position and the briefs that were taken. In 2014, we were able to have oral arguments in front of the judge to show that we had uh, what the treaty said, what the historical arguments were that different former chiefs, different tribal attorneys back in the 19th century said, you know, these individuals have a treaty right citizenship and uh, the United States has the right to enforce the people's rights. And also the uh, federal government took the position in the oral arguments that the U.S. government had never passed a law depriving the freedmen of their treaty rights to citizenship and all rights of Native Cherokee. And that's exactly how Judge Hogan decided the case in Cherokee Nation versus Nash Van in August 2017. So coming full, full circle on that, here we are in 2021, and the Cherokee Nation is currently working on a project about the Cherokee freedmen to educate people um, and to bring, just to bring some more understanding. What, what do you know about that project? Well, I don't know a lot about the project because my understanding is it's not really getting kicked off until this month. History of the freedmen, a lot of it was covered up because the, you had tribal leaders who didn't want it out there. So when books were being written, things that the tribe was funding, documentaries, anything like that, there was nothing in there about the, the freedmen or the tribe. There needs to be documents and the history of the freedmen out there and available for people to, you know, learn about, to hear about the true history. And, and then those people who are apprehensive about the freedmen being in the mm -hmm. tribe, maybe they'll feel more comfortable. I'm all about reconciliation in the tribe and people coming together, if possible, but everybody's rights need to be respected. So I understand you are running for a seat on the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council. What made you want to run? I became a member of the Cherokee Nation in 2006, and immediately I registered to vote. I have voted in every election since I became a member of the tribe, that there was an election for my area. So I have been involved, I believe, in knowledge about the tribe. I also have tried to work on community things, assisting people, and not just freedmen people, when there has been the need for citizens to help elders, for instance, to try to apply for things like the COVID-19 money, you know, to just sit down with people and help them with applications or the keep seagull, the Indian farmers payments and things like this. And, you know, I think I can do more as a member of the council in helping people, listening to people about their needs, taking them to the council. I want to be a voice who listens and fights for the people's needs. I think we'll leave it there. Marilyn Van, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you. You're listening to Focus Black Oklahoma. 
Hi, I'm Matthew Biriapa, host of KOSU's music podcast, No Cover. There, I have conversations with musical artists, like how black musicians are creating music at the intersection of race in Oklahoma. Why do we have these like low-key racist like specifications for how we classify art? When I think of the question, what is the soundtrack of the Black Lives Matter movement? I can't think of any other place but Oklahoma. Listen to No Cover on NPR One or wherever you get your podcasts. With the Trump administration coming to its conclusion and the Biden administration coming to power, black citizens are left waiting to see how these administrative changes will impact their lived experience, specifically their economic mobility. Mika Nicole explores the potential outcomes with a financial expert who speaks candidly about black people's unique financial challenges and how this new administration plans to address them. In the 2016 presidential election, Donald J. Trump garnered just 8% of the black electorate. Less than 60 days before the election, he unveiled the Black Economic Empowerment Platinum Plan, a two-page list arranged in bullet points with an overall promise to increase access to capital in black communities by almost $500 billion. This plan included promises such as 3 million new jobs for the black community, access to better education and job training, opportunities and providing better and tailored health care to address historic disparities. These were bold ideas for an administration that supported overturning the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, which would leave millions of Americans without health care. President Trump's effort to galvanize black voters failed and President-elect Joe Biden claimed victory. Biden thanked his black supporters during his victory speech declaring, you've always had my back and I'll have yours. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris also singled out black voters, calling them the backbone of our democracy. The racial disparities present in the economy, education, health care, and criminal justice systems, voting rights, and environmental health concerns have undeniably predisposed vulnerable populations to a higher percentage of COVID-19 deaths, higher student loan debt, and fewer job opportunities, in addition to the discrimination in receipt of COVID relief funds, police brutality, lower wages, and more. President-elect Biden has presented a comprehensive agenda aimed at placing Black Americans in a better economic and educational position. But how exactly will the implementation of this agenda help Black Americans, and how have Black Americans fared without an agenda thus far? LaToya Rose, business operations coach, master tax strategist, and owner of Rose Tax Solutions, offered ideas on financial trends within the Black community. She was finishing a consultation with a new client, Nehemiah McCreary when I entered her office in the historic Greenwood District of Tulsa. McCreary is a young black entrepreneur with a candle making company who, like many others, had no clue regarding the importance of building and maintaining credit. Well, it wasn't really a decision. Um, Ranter didn't know that I absolutely needed it until I met her, which I know I didn't have a lot of the knowledge, but after meeting and talking with her, I seen a lot of my errors and knowing that I needed her help. Biden's plan involves advancing the economic mobility of African Americans and closing racial wealth and income gaps. The typical white family holds about 10 times more wealth than the typical African American family. Because that's the biggest thing in our community. We do not um, introduce our children to money. Miss Rose spoke candidly of her financial woes before she became a credit expert. The problem with a payday loan is that the interest rate on a payday loan. So if I got hundred dollars, I was having to pay them back like one fifty. So if I needed a hundred dollars to get to the next payday, now you're taking that hundred plus fifty more, like you really putting me behind. It almost becomes predatory lending in a way. Like you know I already need your help, but then you're putting me out here, you know what I'm saying, to basically always be drowning. I'm never out of quicksand. Biden's initiative hopes to restore the federal government's power to enforce settlements against discriminatory and predatory lenders that charge interest rates as high as 200 percent and target poor communities. During the COVID-19 crisis, Congress made the decision to include nonprofits and religious institutions in the Paycheck Protection Program and the Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Programs. Pastor Robert Turner of the historic Vernon AME Church shares his thoughts about how the crisis has financially affected his house of worship. The churches can't even benefit from that because churches are non-tax entities. So we wouldn't get any benefit by developing 
what we got from that proposal. The Lift Every Voice agenda also aims to tackle racial bias by lenders and appraisers in communities of color. When all factors are the same, housing in communities of color is valued at tens of thousands of dollars below communities populated by majority white homeowners. He compared them to where black people live today in Tulsa, and it's still the same. So the same red line that they did to keep us in these communities uh, back in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, that he overlaid it with today's map and the demographics of what black people live in Tulsa, and it's the same. While waiting for Biden's plan to be implemented, Ms. Rose offers some steps we can take as a community to ensure we are prepared when these opportunities arrive. We won't invest in professional help. We feel everything is so easy. Well, they just doing, they just checking off the spending. I could do that. No, you can't. You don't know what I'm looking for. You don't know how I'm categorizing it. You don't know what the tax law is that I'm trying to correlate your spending to so I can justify so you don't have to pay, you can pay zero in taxes. We have an issue as Blacks thinking everybody's trying to get over on us. But the biggest thing with the wealth gap, I would say, is not having that professional help, not investing in it, wanting everything for free, and then trying to put a twist on it. Yeah, she said do it like this, but I can do these steps. She said gave me five steps. I can do steps one and three. I'll do one, two, and five. Well, what about three and four? I gave you five steps for a reason. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Mika Nicole in North Tulsa. Our next story is one that will hit close to home for many. It is a traumatic experience that has touched nearly every household. It impacts the relationships between parents and children, siblings and spouses. Sandra Slade covers this unfolding crisis. One day, I was riding with my mom doing errands, and I kept hearing a noise in her trunk. It was a rolling sound like something was moving. I asked my mom, did she hear that? She turns up her music and says no. We kept riding, and whenever we would stop, the item would hit the trunk with a clunk. I asked her if she had a body we needed to go dump. She turned, stared me straight in the eyes, and said no, it was nothing and kept driving. You know I shut my mouth then. Once we got to her house, she took all day to get her bags out. Like all day. Finally, she opened her trunk, and I noticed that she had two bottles of Red Mountain Dew, a box of cheese crackers with peanut butter, and a bag of Lay's chips. When I asked her why she had them in her trunk, my mother said they were hers and she didn't want to share. See, at this time, my two adult sisters were living with my mom, and she said if she took her items in the house, they would disappear. I laughed and asked her, didn't you teach us to share? She said yes, and then she said, I'm tired of having my mouth all tuned up for something and not having it when I wanted it. I laughed out loud for several minutes. You know, if you're not familiar with the term tuned up, it means to have a taste for a drink, a meal, leftover, a snack that you just can't wait to get back to. This pandemic has us all in close quarters. I've been both blessed and stressed to have my 13-year-old in virtual school and my 19-year-old back home from college. Although I think they've turned me into a different version of the help, you know, cooking and cleaning, but we do enjoy each other. Most parents know if you ask a kid to find something, they will swear they've looked high and low for it and still can't find it. Take that same kid and try to quietly open a bag of chips. They will hear that from three rooms away. You know, kids come with an innate ability to find and destroy all food items in their path, especially teenagers. Seems like they have supersonic hearing and their sense of smell is only matched by their ability to sleep all day long. You know, I like a good meal, and I eat small bites, so occasionally I have some leftovers. Soon as I put them in the fridge, it seems like they're on the countdown because someone's going to ask me if I'm going to eat it. I make the grocery list, and occasionally I will add in a treat or two, such as chips, candy, or soda. You know, I had some leftover Thanksgiving fixings, and my mouth was tuned up for it, and lunch was approaching. Leaving my office area, it seemed like I could smell my food. But no, I think I was just hangry. Now, when I get to the kitchen, the 19-year-old is standing by the microwave, looking as if he doesn't have a care in the world. He pulls out my carefully wrapped up plate and proceeds to walk past me. And I say, hold up, that's mine. He says, it's been in the fridge for a couple of days. I didn't think you wanted it. Like, dude, are you serious? That was in the back of the fridge. You had to move a whole pot of freshly prepared soup just to see it. He casually says, are you really going to eat it? I said, yes, and I took the plate. Find you something else. Now, I know this doesn't sound like a good mom, but I make the grocery list, and I add in the occasional treat, like soda, pop, candy, or favorite cereal. I'm entitled to keep food I want in my fridge. Oh, wait, I sound like my mom. Since the pandemic, I've had to get creative with hiding my food. Putting a piece of chicken in the vegetable crisper, a Twix bar hidden behind three cloves of garlic, M&Ms in a cleaned-out medicine bottle, mac and cheese hidden in a yogurt container. 
chips in an empty oatmeal box, even homemade peanut brittle hidden among my head wraps. If you think food hiding is not that serious, I beg to differ. A friend of mine lived with her mom and her sister. She had been contemplating moving out, but her mother could really cook. One day, her mother fixed these pork chops, and according to my friend, they were so delicious and tasty, her mom had really got down with those. When her sister decided she didn't want any, she happily wrapped up the remaining two and put them in the fridge. The next day, my girlfriend went to work. And all while she was at work, she was daydreaming of what size she was going to put with those pork chops. Arriving home, her mouth was more than tuned up and ready for those pork chops as she set some water to boil for rice. She started looking for the pork chops, but didn't immediately see them. She didn't panic. She just figured someone had moved them to the back. Keeping an eye on the water, she pulled things out one at a time. Still, she didn't find them, so she ended up calling her mom and asked her if she knew where they were. Her mom said no. Frustrated and the water boiling at this point, she calls her sister, and her sister says with casual audacity, Oh, yeah. A friend of mine wanted to taste mom's pork chops because, you know, I was bragging on them. So I brought her one, and I ate the other one. Why? My friend hung up on her sister. She turned off the water and decided to take a shower to cool off. She called me and told me that she decided to move because she was crying in the shower like she lost her best friend. She said her crying was worse than the crying game cry. I said, over a pork chop? Was it that good? She said it was the way her sister was so casual about it. She figured she could never have anything of her own after that as long as she stayed with them. That next week, she moved out. So parents, I see you out there munching on your candy bar, eating your takeout in the car, eating your favorite food before heading inside the house. The next time you have your mouth tuned up for something, make sure you've gotten a good hiding place. It turns out sometimes just putting it in plain sight can be the best hiding place. Don't be scared to savor your food. I say that as I pull out some ribs that were in a bag labeled broccoli. <laughs> Focus Black Oklahoma is produced in partnership with KOSU Radio, Tulsa Artist Fellowship, and Tri-City Collective. Our theme music is by Moffitt Music. Our contributing music artists on this broadcast are Matt Leone and Dr. View. Our executive producer is Karesh Ali Lansana. Associate producers are Bracken Clark and Ali Shaw. Visit us online at kosu.org and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Focus Black OK.